from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're so pleased to have you here for this very exciting concert tonight. Um, I am here with three amazing musicians that you'll get to hear doing lots of different things, lots of different types of music, um, just kind of in extraordinary ways. Um, they're with the ensemble Either Or, and we have uh, Taka Kigawa, uh, Richard Carrick, who's a director and conductor, and also rep represented as a composer tonight and then uh, Jennifer Choi. And so um, please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the first question that I have is the one that's on all of our minds. Is it either either or either <laughs> or? It's either way you'd like to say. <laughs> if that gives you a hint. <laughs> Excellent. How did, could you say just a little bit about how the ensemble came together and... Oh, sure. Uh, so the ensemble, we started in 2004. It's co-directed by David Shively, a fabulous percussionist and curator who's not here tonight. Uh, but um, we started the group quite small with three musicians. And we were really, we had moved back to New York. We were in UCSD, San Diego, doing our PhD in DMAs. And when we moved back to New York, I, I had lived in New York before, and I was not necessarily always hearing the music I wanted to hear. And I thought, well, let's just start playing some of the stuff that we don't hear that often in New York. And that was the, that was the beginning of the group. And, and David and I worked very closely to kind of develop this strange um, repertoire <laughs> that we've been developing. And as, the, as we kept going, the group got bigger and we were able to do um, larger shows and very fortunate to be able to bring on these incredible musicians. Um, you've been, Jennifer Choi's been with us for 10 years now. We're very excited. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is the 10 year anniversary. I'm really excited. <laughs> and also, uh, it's been 17 years since the first time I played at the Library of Congress, too. So oh, I'm feeling right. really special today, like extremely special. And what did you do when you were here before? Um, that was the, there was a John Zorn uh, portrait. I don't know if any of you were here then, but uh, it was, it was, was it 1999 or 2000? I think it was 2000. But, um, and we played the, the violin piano duo, Lo Momo. Were you here for that? Oh, wow. oh, hello again. <laughs> That's great. You've got a dedicated audience. Yeah, this. it's amazing. <laughs> That's, and so it's a really special day for me. Fantastic. And then Taka, you you must have joined. Yeah. Like about five. Uh, comparing to Jennifer, I'm kind of new. Just, <laughs> just uh, two or three years, I'm very new. <laughs> but we're very happy, and Taka has been amazing as a chamber musician, and also as a soloist, which you'll get to hear tonight. And Jennifer also. A fabulous soloist. So the group kind of keeps growing, and now we do um, mixed concerts, either with um, conducted chamber ensemble, small chamber orchestra size, as well as um, pretty intense kind of chamber music. So you'll hear a little bit of both tonight. Yeah, I think that's one of the fascinating things about this evening. I think you'll agree with me after you hear it, um, is that there's this great variety of instrumentation and types of music that you'll hear. Um, but it actually coheres, I think, really well. Um, I'm assuming that's just because of great programming, but um, so that, but it's uh, really something. And we'll t I thought we could maybe talk a bit about the program, and uh, <clears throat> you know, just kind of get into each piece a little bit. Maybe starting with the first one, the Braxton. Um, I understand that that's been quite an experience to put it together. Um, uh, a lot of uh, you know, people assume that you just look at it. Uh, uh, if, if you're not a musician, maybe you just have a score in front of you and you use that as a, as a way to get, you know, translate from what you see on the page to uh, how you play. And that, that is still what you do, kind of, but what's different about it with the Braxton? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to point out that the, the score is actually here. So I really encourage all of you, before you walk into the concert, to please look at the Anthony Braxton score. There's also the, some of the Ligeti. But the Braxton score in particular is probably something you haven't seen before. Um, 
Because he invented it all. It's amazing, this guy, how he, he, comes, he comes from it from a performer's perspective, from an intellectual perspective, from a sound perspective, and from a, a game almost kind of like um, improvising perspective. And you see that in the score. Um, so did you want to say a little bit about the score? Uh, sure. So this is his composition number 222. And um, he he wrote this in 1995, and it was it was after he was he went to a course on Native American music. So he he called it the ghost trance music. This this particular piece, and um, he he was really interested in the ritual um, dance music and music for other purposes than just in the concert hall. So he's going for that. And then there's specific symbols like circles and triangles and squares that come out of a note head, and that's where we're supposed to start improvising. And then we have to find each other also in the score out of that and come back to the ghost trance. So the piece actually could go on for about 24 hours. <laughs> we have to do it today in like 10 minutes or something like that. <laughs> but um, but, but he, that's what he wants. He wants you to, you don't have to play all, thir there's 30 pages or 33, I forget how many pages mm -hmm. now. Yeah, there's 33. There's no way we could do all 33. He doesn't expect you to, but you do have to make some choices. And that can be either very, very difficult or well, I actually think that's difficult mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to make these choices with the material that's given. But that's what we had to do. Yeah, and one of the things he does is he sets up many paradigms. So you can, you can pick and choose at different points what you want to do, but you don't know what the other person is going to do. <laughs> and for example, there's a symbol which is a circle. He might attach it to a note. But then there's also a symbol which is a triangle, and there's a symbol that's a square. They all look pretty similar, right? But the circle means you improvise. The triangle means you stop playing that piece and you immediately go to another piece that he's written in composition 222. And the square means you can stop playing that piece and immediately play any other piece he has written. <laughs> so, it's pretty open. <laughs> Um, and actually, in the in the case, uh, th there is the score of the tertiary material. It's numbered one, two, three, and four. So <clears throat> those are more um, specific, and he wants you to go through them like uh, note by note. So we do, we ch we chose. I'll just give you uh, the secret in, but we chose two of them to play tonight, not all four. <laughs> you can guess which two, <laughs> but they're all displayed there in the cabinet, which is nice. So if you can go to these other pieces, um, does he do anything special with the clefts or something? Or can you just pick any line from those pieces? Or yeah, he's um, he believes that all all of his music can be played on all instruments at any time. So he's got this really interesting synthesis. Braxton comes from many traditions. You know, you, some of you are probably thinking, oh, this this relates to Cage in a way. The improvisation thing might come out of a jazz tradition. Um, Stockhausen was a big influence on him, and he cites that in a number of examples. So he's really um, going deeper with a lot of these ideas that were around when he was performing. He's an incredible musician. And, um, and, and he would just kind of put them all together in this unique way. So how do you notate for any instrument at any time? So you still use the five-line staff, but he uses his own clef. And you can, uh, you can do it in treble clef. You can do a bass clef. You can do it in treble clef three octaves higher or lower. You can do it in alto clef. You can switch from one note to tenor to soprano to alto clef. And, and the, uh, that's called the diamond clef. And you'll see the diamond, right? And he also does that with accidentals. He has a star accidental. It could be a flat. It could be a natural. <laughs> it could be a sharp. <laughs> and we don't know what each other are going to do. Do you find that you play it? differently as you're doing it? Or do you do some mapping and some spontaneous choices? Or? Uh, yes um, and no. <laughs> <laughs> 
because either way can be frustrating, right? So you're trying to play everything on the page, and that almost got more frustrating for some reason. Then when we decided to open it up, oh, that that sounds good for today. And then we tried the open way, to you know, in the next rehearsal. I was like, oh, well, it sounded better yesterday. I wonder why. So I don't know. Maybe he wants you to just be listening constantly and on a dime have to be able to switch devise some structure within the piece by yourself and definitely interpret, interpret, interpret the whole time, so. Well, that's great. I should mention that this piece uh, that we're going to hear tonight was commissioned by the Library of Congress, the McKim Fund in the Library of Congress. Um, so you know, we're very excited to have it played. I don't believe it's been played in Coolidge since it was premiered here in 1998. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, this will be a treat. Yeah, well, it's an honor for us to play it here, really sure. excited. Well, the next piece that that's comes up on the program is one of Richard's pieces. Um, and maybe you can just give us a little bit of, uh, I understand that this piece has uh, multiple guises in which it can be performed. Oh, right, so this, uh, I was very interested in, um, you know, most of the composers on tonight's program as well reflect this as a systems-based approach. So you kind of have a logical, form and, and a logical way of dealing with pitches and kind of working things out and creating incredible color and, and intensity through that. And in this piece, I come out of that tradition compositionally, but in this piece, I was very interested in creating um, uh, descriptions. Uh, I was influenced, uh, you could read it in the program notes, but I was influenced by Albert Camus' L'Etranger, uh, The Stranger, and specifically the scene the end of the first chapter, the first part, uh, where Merceau is on the beach and he sees the stranger and then there's this, this um, he sees the sun, he sees uh, the sweat and the shimmering light and he has this act, this murderous act and the intensity in which that scene begins is incredible because it begins on this beautiful beach in Algeria and it's very calm and there's somebody in the back and this is the only time music is referenced in the whole book. There's someone playing an, an out of tune flute and they're only kind of getting three notes out of it and they're just kind of cycling through these three notes. And I thought that's a fascinating place to start. So I kind of put the flute as the description of kind of what's going on around there. And then I had the cello and the bass clarinet representing kind of the inner turmoil of the scene. So one is expressing the outward serenity or absurdity, and, the, and then the lower instruments are kind of the emotional grit. And these two kind of coincide. They first start off very separately and they come together. You know, one thing I noticed just listening in rehearsal was that, <clears throat> excuse me, as you mentioned, there's this, um, you, have, you have these pairs and they're actually often playing near unison duet type uh, materials um, together, but they're just slightly, uh, like for instance, the flute is a slightly off in terms of pitch, maybe, the, mm -hmm. or doing slightly more ornamentation or something like that, right. um, almost like a camouflage technique. <laughs> But, um, uh, I had not heard that. <laughs> um, but uh, can you say a bit more about that? Because I think it's a really intriguing aspect of mm. it. Well, so the flute does this thing where the flute is out of tune, but then the piano is kind of in and out of that tuning world. And so, you know, sometimes it sounds like the flute is in tune and the piano might be out of tune. And, and getting into this place where... Um, it, it kind of dimensionalizes each of the characters a little bit more. So you're not just playing together all the time, but you're kind of, there's a similarity here with the Braxton, I think, you know, um, and you'll hear it, I think, in the terms of the continuity of the concert. Um, the parts are all notated in my piece, but we're kind of going in and out of each other compositionally and sonically. It's a really beautiful piece. You, this, you also have it for another arrangement of right it was originally written for piccolo and cello and then we actually we premiered it on violin and piano um, and tenor saxophone and musical saw <laughs> <laughs> and in this version it's for flute and piano and bass clarinet and cello so but again this the, there's this interesting thing where these melodies and these fragments 
are, they're, they're interesting in themselves, but it's actually, every instrument can bring so much color and difference into the quality. So that's why I've been, I don't do it that often, but in this particular case, I have orchestrated it for different instruments and explored the richnesses of those instruments. Fantastic. Um, so the, maybe we can talk about uh, the Fuhrer as the, the two together, because they're um, two remarkable pieces in very different ways, I think you'll find. Um, one is a, kind of, a, I think, one of his classic works now, Spur, um, that we'll hear at the end of the first half. And the other, this is the DC premiere, I think, of, um, of a clarinet quintet. So the first one's for piano and string quartet, and the other one's for uh, clarinet and string quartet. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot to say about these pieces, but um, maybe one thing that strikes me is that although they're very different, the first one's almost full of frenetic activity and energy, um, the second one doesn't seem to be at first, but yet there's this kind of latent energy in both that, so maybe you can speak about what it's like to perform these pieces. Taka, you want to say something about Spur? <laughs> well, we could, uh, starting off by saying something about Spur, um, Spur is a piece where the piano part is rapid 30 second notes throughout. And the string quartet are also kind of the, this dual personality. They're completely integrated, but they almost never play exactly the same. It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult <laughs> because, uh, you know, normally you have downbeats together or something like that, and he doesn't do that in this piece. Um, so it's kind of a meta listening, I think, is happening here. Yeah, and it's, it's also interesting to know that he put specifically a spur for piano and the string quartet. He didn't put for piano quintet. Mm -hmm. So piano and the string quartet playing together, but I always feel like when on the performance or rehearsing, where am I? Am I playing with a string quartet or very string quartet, those four boys and girls playing here, but I'm like here. <laughs> we are together, but at the same time, not together. Very peculiar experience anytime. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like when discussing string, string card player, discussing phrasing or rhythm, I feel like I'm nowhere. I, I feel so helpless. But at the same time, we are really playing together. So very strange feeling. So yeah. if you were off, it would definitely feel off. So it's like yeah. one of those things where you have to be exactly on for it to feel correctly off. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> very, very, very. And I think that's, that's how he works. Um, we, we had a, a, each of us has had a opportunity to work with him on a different level. And when he came to New York City, I was doing a large ensemble piece. So we had pretty much a full orchestra. And he was so specific about every dynamic that he wants, every nuance, every extended technique. And I was sitting, I think, somewhere in the back of the first violin somewhere, the very back. And he's listening from kind of inside the orchestra. And he said, OK, everybody stop. And he pointed me out. And he said, you're playing too loud. <laughs> I, it was like, well, everything was supposed to be PP or PPP or PPP, whatever. But he could hear that. So that's the, the extent of, of how meticulously he writes. Now, you might listen to it and think, oh, well, you know, this could be like an improvised thing. We have a lot of pizzicatos and like, you know, somebody plays here and then here is like, do, 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 like that. But it's not. It's like you have to really have it in your body, the rhythm in your body. Yeah. So for that piece. For sure. You know, an another interesting thing about this piece that um, I was mentioning to Taka earlier that uh, in a lot of, of uh, Fur's piano music, he, he tends to do these kind of octave, splaying octaves that go across the <laughs> compass of the keyboard, um, but also in almost intentional, well, I mean, obviously intentional because he writes it, but um, uh, not wrong notes, but kind of moving away from some sort of octave center. So in this case, it might be a minor ninth, it might be a major seventh somewhere, but there's this kind of gradual type of thing, and it always tends to snap back until finally it shifts or something. And it's kind of this uh, amazing thing to listen to over time, I think, uh, and it's, uh, so I'm really excited about it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, the, how, how would you uh, categorize, or not categorize, but think about the clarinet quintet compared to that piece? 
Um, okay, so in the clarinet quintet, which was written in 2013, he's exploring something completely different. So he's, he wants to stretch time, especially in the beginning. He wants the whole, it, it, the, the whole piece is around 30 minutes, actually. In the first 15 minutes, that's half of the piece, he's trying to um, do everything in slow motion. That's the whole point. And Interno al Bianco is um, it's a reference to a piece of literature, actually, um, an Italian piece. And it, actually, he says it doesn't have to do with the actual title. Uh, but he's exploring light and all um, s sense of light. But he, but you have to imagine and all the colors and all the distinctions. And he's trying to make um, if light were to sound like something, this is what it would sound like. So we're supposed to try to find this um, place in our sh in our string playing and also in the clarinet where we blend, but it's a certain sound that maybe you haven't heard before, and he just stays there for 15 minutes. That's that's a big deal, and then the piece starts to evolve. Hmm. I don't want to give everything away. Sure, sure. <laughs> but one of the fascinating things about that piece, I I hear the piece. I think he. I, I think he wrote it last year, actually. Oh, is that right? Because it was just premiered in September, and then we premiered Sorry, it in the U.S. a okay. few weeks ago in New York. And this is the, as you said, the D.C. premiere. And in, it, I think it's a new phase in his music. Yeah. Uh, I, you heard it. We, the last few pieces from 2013 to 16, there's, there's a change going on in his music. And in this piece, it's pretty full-blown. Uh, one of the things that happens is acoustics become so important in the way that in Spur, it's all about these little motives. You know, this kind of frenetic um, micro intensity throughout the whole piece. But in Intorno, the, the piece really opens up and the acoustics and the sounds of the instruments, the way they're interacting with each other sonically um, is phenomenal. Uh, it takes such concentration to kind of play these pieces. And there's also something about how long the piece is. You know, we, we tend to hear, it's a funny thing, like, do you think you'd hear the same, let's say we took the first 30 seconds of a piece. I I, I've never th tried this before, but let's say you take first 30 seconds of a piece, and then you hear it at the beginning of the piece. It means something. But if you heard that same 30 seconds, three minutes into the piece, it might mean something else, depending on what came before. If you take that first 30 seconds and you hear it 15 minutes into the piece, you could imagine how that same piece of music would have a different meaning because of its context. And I think what he does in this piece is he stretches out the, the scale a little bit to the point where we really get lost in this slow, expansive music. We're no longer just waiting for it to get fast. It's, that's where we are. And we start to hear the music differently for that reason. You know, another thing just to point out is that, as you just said, stretches out the scale. Literally, he does that with the scales going up and down. Um, so sometimes they're with uh, microtonal types of things. There's slow glissandi between, which I think would imagine would be difficult to control. <laughs> um, but uh, but there's this kind of over and actually the same kind of thing is happening at a much faster rate uh, in spur I think it, not actually a faster rate but just there is this upward motion that that kind of occurs in both but some of the strings are going down while the others are going up and um, it's it is something that kind of creates this um, these moments of interaction that you can kind of anticipate but you're not quite sure how he's going to handle each you know, interaction like exactly. that. Well, the, the glissande that you're talking about, David, is um, maybe over a six-second period, he asks you to do a glissando, but it's from E to E quarter flat. <laughs> it's not even to E flat. So, you know, and in rehearsal, they're like, I think you got to that E quarter flat a little bit too early. And <laughs> <laughs> After five seconds instead of six. So the level of listening that's going on when, when they play is pretty intense. And so if you hear an E flat, it's wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, these are, these are fantastic pieces. I think you're going to enjoy them a great deal. Uh, and just before we get to that final uh, Furrer Quintet, um, we get to hear a selection of five Ligeti Etudes. 
Um, I have to admit, I'm a big Liggety fan, so this is an exciting moment for me personally just to be able to hear these. And um, uh, uh, Taka, maybe you can say a bit about um, why these particular ones, or uh, just your experience playing, because you play all of the etudes. So. Taka has given uh, many performances of the whole set, and so we're very excited to be able to share some of these. Thank you. Uh, tonight, five only. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, like David, I'm a huge Lingeti fan. I've been playing this set of pieces more than uh, six years or seven years, maybe 10 years. As soon as it's published, I got a score and start practicing and enjoying. It's uh, so original and, of course, difficult. Uh, I'm sure everyone here, most of you know. At the same time, very fun, very rewarding, very good musical experiment, just to practice for yourself and uh, performance in public like a um, festival to me. <laughs> so, uh, and to, to, for this concert, I picked those five pieces. I tried to uh, pick most interesting, fun, attractive, and musically meaningful five. So I picked a uh, fanfare, fanfare, and femme, and words uh, uh, of autumn, autumn uh, Varsovia, and uh, open strings, uh, called Advit, and uh, l'escalier du diable uh, was devil's, devil's staircase. These are five difficult pieces, where each one is difficult, but I try to create a, create a program, five sets, as a coherent in terms of harmony, tempi, and also structure. So that's how I chose those five pieces. So one thing I can say that's maybe, at least what I hear from a, at a surface level, is that the first and the fifth have a lot to do with upward scales, mm -hmm. and the second and the fourth really emphasize the fifth, Yes. Not the fifth piece, but the interval. Yeah, it's an interval. Yeah. And then that middle one is just one of the great ones, and that's the more descending scale. Yes, so all, all chromatic descending. Yeah. And also polyrhythm. It's a very important factor when it comes to lingati. So right hand playing this rhythm, ta -pa -pa -pa, left hand, ta -ta 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 -ta, and both hands, ta -ta 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 -ta. so lots of rhythms are going on at the same time. That's one of the, the most. The layers are, it's, it's incredible, because you yeah. hear these distinctive yeah. scales going down, but to, to imagine playing them and controlling those mm. is, is quite something. So very original kind of rhythmic uh, you know, management. Right. I, mean, I mentioned to um, Richard when we were first talking about this that uh, when I first uh, just got the music just to take a look at it, mm. the, the first book, it was all, um, it was the facsimile of the yes. handwritten manuscript. When you learned these, did you learn from Yes, the manuscript, manuscript yes. So I, I literally used a magnifier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> His handwriting is very, very small and not so easy to read. So. Well, yeah. he was one of the composers who, I, I don't think anyone had a ruler in, like when he, he never used a ruler. So every stem <laughs> kind of looked like a note as well. It was incredibly, yeah. Yeah. incredibly challenging. Very music. challenging. And too. tiny, like you said. It was, it was, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wow. So do you still use that Oh, music? no, I, I'm using a printed out, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just like you can see at the whole way. Yeah. But there's something about reading from manuscript. You, you get a different, you get the composer's intent. Yeah. You know, the way, where they, where they put symbols, um, the closer they put it to a note, or how they indicate important moments. Uh, you get that from the manuscript, and then when it's engraved, you might or might not get it. So having started with the manuscript, um, it's usually more work, but it's often more rewarding in terms of mm -hmm. uh, figuring out your own personal interpretation, because you have to not only play these notes, but you have to internalize them, and that's where the interpretation comes from. You have to be yourself inside of the score. Well, by the way, Beato Fura is still using, uh, I mean, handwriting. He never used a computer. That's right. There's also something about Ligeti in terms of the well, maybe we're going to get to this in a second, but in terms of the program. Because um, I guess his pieces are probably the oldest pieces. But in some ways, I feel like Ligeti's music has, you see his effects as a master composer, as someone, I, I think in different ways, kind of influenced everyone else on the program. Huh. You know, very interesting, because you, you hear the kind of perpetual rhythmic quality in the Braxton. Um, 
you, uh, Thorval de Tier, we haven't spoken about her yet, but I think she was very influenced by his more spatial and, and micro-polyphony <coughs> qualities. Um, and then the fur, I think there's so many relationships with the ligety. So, you know, one of the things uh, to think about when you listen to the concert is, like, how are these pieces interrelated? What's, what's a common thread? What isn't? Uh, where do they, they spread apart? I don't know. I, I always find that interesting. So, so in a way, Ligeti is a key. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be one of the keys, or Braxton could be one of the keys, you know? Yeah. If you see a square, you switch to Ligeti really quickly. <laughs> uh, but I, I, didn't, I inadvertently skipped over um, the piece Rho. Um, you guys should consider changing your name to either Rho for that one. That was another, but if you, only if you play it backwards. But um, maybe you can say a little bit about uh, this piece, because it, while it is um, a, a different sort of work on the program, it does, as you say, when you just mentioned micro polyphony, um, it has, a, again, like kind of this internal energy that's trying to come out of the sound, it seems like, as you're listening to it, even though it has this, um, you know, the title of serenity and the feeling of that, in a sense, there is this kind of energy that's bubbling out of it. Um, how do you, uh, maybe you can just say a few things. Have, did you work with the composer at all with this piece? We did. We had the pleasure of um, working with Anna Thorvaldatir, who's a young Icelandic composer. And she's currently very busy. She's one of the young composers with the New York Philharmonic. Um, and her music is being performed widely internationally. Um, and we had the pleasure of inviting her to uh, Miller Theater in 2014, where we did a concert of her music, and we premiered some of her pieces. And we played this piece and a few other pieces. Uh, and that was really lovely. Uh, she's a great person to work with. And one of the things about this piece is you'll hear, it's, it's called Serenity. So there's some music in there that is very serene. But then there's, she also gives you other things to kind of poke around and, and put, put that in context. So there's this kind of um, a shadow of expressivity that happens in the music, I feel like. You know, so she's creating a stillness, but she's also alluding to something else. And then there are these really interesting things happening with the percussion and the piano. I won't give it away because you will see it. <laughs> and in the beautiful hall here, you will hear it beautifully. Um, but it also sets you up for, um, you know, it's, it's a piece that you, you might ask yourself while you're listening to it, what am I feeling? Am I, am, am I feeling serenity? Am I experiencing serenity? Is this piece alluding to an imagined serenity? Or is this piece just referencing her state of mind when she wrote it? You know, this is, these are all interesting questions when you can listen. And this is a piece you can really kind of um, have your mind focused on how the music is, is speaking to you. You know, I, I don't want to, I hope I'm not giving away one of the things that you're mentioning, but um, I was speaking with Russell a little bit about the, about the percussion and the poetic uh, use of wood. Mm -hmm. um, um, but one of the things that, um, which you'll see, um, well, one of the, it's a beautiful uh, way to use it. And one of the things that she, he, that she uh, was very specific about was the type of mallet that you'd be using with each of these uh, maybe unusual instruments as well. And so there's this um, great level of detail that comes into play. Um, but uh, the overall effect, it's like you have this combination of, of uh, things happening at that um, low level and also at that broader level. And it's and like you say, it's that you attend to different things just depending on your state of mind maybe mm -hmm. or something. Um, well, before we get to some questions from the audience, um, maybe you can say a bit about what you might be up to next, like what's, what's next on the agenda for the ensemble and individually? No, sure. Um, well, we're constantly evolving as a group <laughs> and always uh, looking to do programs and work with composers and venues that kind of put us in a new place. You know, so um, we're working with um, a Swedish um, Dutch composer in April. We'll be flying to Sweden next month. A few of us are going. And we're perform premiering his big piece there with another group there called Ensemble Sun. And then we're coming back to New York in April. Um, and uh, that's kind of the, the next thing. But you know, the group, um, we have, they're, 
the, the, the core of the group is actually the fact that we have these incredible soloists. Um, it's not just chamber music, it's chamber music made with soloists, and, and we're really excited about that kind of energy. So we're, we're all kind of doing many different projects. You've, you've got a concert here tomorrow, don't you? Uh, yeah, but that's a different <laughs> situation at the National Gallery. Um, uh, Some yeah. of you may be going already to that, I bet. Oh, was, yeah. yes, yeah. It, another composer, Tamar Muscal, um, and she wrote a piece for uh, that goes along with a black and white film, and so we're playing live string quartet with voice. Um, it's going to be really fun, I think. Um, so we're rehearsing that, but um, uh, we're, we're oftentimes working on new music, um, different composers, commissions, um, uh, a couple of different groups. Some of us are in different groups as well. Have the uh, the other violinist Paula Garcia and John Popham have a trio called Long Leash, um, and and they'll play uh, works for piano trio, but by similar composers. So it's really nice how we can bring in our um, knowledge and and inspiration from the other times that we've worked with these composers and and come into either or. Um, I guess I would say we have a number of recordings. And uh, we just released a few recordings, one with Anthony Coleman, um, which came out earlier this year on New World Records, and Elliot Sharp. We're on his latest CD as well. Uh, my CD came out last year with a recording of that. And so we've been pretty active and really fortunate to be able to put this stuff down in some um, sort of... And one other, uh, we worked with uh, Mia Masaoka, who's um, the, the uh, composer and um, performer as well. And she's married to George Lewis, who is also part of the AACM. And uh, either, either or is going to be performing her work in March at National Sawdust. So that should be pretty exciting. That's the new venue in Brooklyn. Yeah. Ooh, Fantastic. Ooh, ooh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Taka, what about you? What's your next, are you going to tackle... Uh, uh, being a pianist, I have a lot of projects going on, and oh, actually I'm playing Richard's piece in April in New York City. It's a piece by young, living, very active composers, and Richard Carrick, and also who else? Uh, Sean Shepard, and Zosia Di Castori, and uh, one or two more solo piano pieces. That's my next new music project, and uh, I also I'm uh, revisiting the Messian. Bars Catalan, big pieces. That's the whole my, thing? The whole thing. That's, that's his thing. That's not <laughs> thing. He doesn't so just that, do that, one. He does the whole favor, thing. Favorite, favorite mission. Yeah, I'm also revisiting uh, J.S. Park, the Art of Fune, and also polishing uh, Pierre Bourdieu's pieces. So lots, lots of things juggling. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Um, uh, why don't we take a moment now uh, just to, if anybody has any questions for the artists before we let them go and, and get ready for the concert. Um, Jay has a microphone, and he can bring it to you. Surely somebody has a question. There we go. One second. So I can't wait to hear the Braxton. The, the, the way you described uh, the improvisation and the jumping around and everything, uh, is, is he unique as a composer in doing that, or do have other composers done that as well? Uh, that's a good question. Composers have done that, and improvisation, you know, if you go back in history, improvisation and composition were almost the same act. I mean, very often you, the composer in, in Mozart's time, he'd improvise a piece, you know, based on these formal um, rules and so forth and kind of deviating from them. So improvisation and composition have always been linked. Uh, it's true that since the... Um, since modern times, you know, certainly in the last hundred years, improvisation has kind of been weeded out of a lot of notated music. But, but Anthony Braxton does it in a very unique way, I think. Um, he really wants to set up this trance, you know? And that's like the, that's one of the great tricks of this piece is, how do you both be in a trance and constantly changing? <laughs> You know, you can't do both. So, so how, do you, how do you kind of deal with that as a performer? What choices do you make and when do you make them? But there are many others who do that. And as Jennifer said, he's part of the um, AACM. And many of those composers, Muhal Richard Abrams, uh, George Lewis, and many others, have been dealing with a lot of these issues. And it's not really just notation and improvisation. It's actually like, 
how do you find new ways of making music with performers, with scores, and so forth? The Association of Advancement of Creative Musicians. So, and they were, they were based out of Chicago. Um, and actually, to answer your question further, I, I had the opportunity to work with four of these amazing, the founding musicians. So, Wadada Leo Smith on the trumpet, um, uh, Leroy Jenkins, George Lewis, and Anthony Braxton. And having seen all of their scores, it's just so amazing how unique each one of them they come from the same generation. Um, Chicago, 1960s, this is when they formed. Um, and they really wanted to, they didn't want to play just jazz. In fact, some of them didn't even have formal jazz training. Not all of them did. So, so it's amazing that each of them came up with completely different systems of doing so, of, of how to do this sort of quasi-structured improv notated pieces. Um, very distinct, very interesting, but also calling for the musician to definitely improvise and go out and, and explore their own world. One thing I would mention too, for if you're interested, that George Lewis actually two years ago wrote a, a biography kind of of the organization um, uh, that's quite big, so you can check that out if you want to learn more about it's it. It's called A Power Stronger Than Itself. No. It's fascinating, yeah. Since we are in the library and you have so many treasures, I was very interested in uh, what you said about the difference between working on the original manuscript score, manuscript, and the final product. Uh, I am sure all of us are aware that the original manuscript score is disappearing. Mm -hmm. I know most of the modern composers do not write they type. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of them do. Some of them still do it the other way. But okay, yes. but, but uh, I think uh, for future generations, and here comes the library, what's going to happen? It's a, it's a tough question, but there, I would say that there are a number of composers who do still write by hand, so uh, we'll just keep collecting their stuff and ignore the rest. No, just kidding. I, um, no, what we, it's, it's a tricky thing. When the library commissions uh, any composer, part of the condition of the commission is that we receive the original manuscript. So um, in the cases, we've, and this has been, especially in the last 10 years, this has been more the case that they have electronically produced scores. So we, we try to get a unique version of it, and the way that we handle it is we ask for something that's um, before it's been submitted to the publisher for uh, kind of the final uh, revisions. And sometimes composers will give us little extra bits, they'll give us a, um, further revisions they might make after the fact, uh, the initial each page, so uh, you know, th there's something about it that's unique um, and still of use to researchers uh, who, who may have access to the published score, but there might be something um, to be found in the, other, in the other one. But it's definitely an issue, and actually one of the bigger issues is for um, composers who uh, have an electroacoustic component to their work. Um, and how does one preserve a uh, you know, particular technology that might be common right now, but 20 years from now, 50 years from now, it's not going to be. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge that is a work in progress, I think. Thank you and good sure. luck. <laughs> I think there's one. Oh, I thought I saw somebody. Oh, there's one of it. Uh, first, I just want to thank David uh, you spoil us with your program notes. Oh, yes. uh, he's a very excellent musicologist, but he also gets inside a score very well. So thank you, David. <laughs> and I just want to ask you, as performers of the Braxton and the other pieces that have this improvisatory element, don't you think it's... Um, about trying to keep it alive, that every performance, the composer's wanting it to be very organic. And this dialogue between audience members and performers and the composer is all wrapped into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there's another book I was just reading, it just, um, just the other day. The, it's called Free Improvisation by Derek Bailey. 
who is just phenomenal. I, I'm so lucky that I had a chance to play with him in New York City uh, before he passed away. But um, he mentions that, like in improv, you, you want to have the audience interaction. You want to feel um, the moment right there. So we can't really predict. That's why you know we started practicing today, and I said, you know what, let's just see what happens because you need that interaction it's actually very crucial um to to know what's gonna play out um and we could we could feel it you know but actually there there's a uh, there's one really good point that derek M uh, bailey mentions in this book and he says sometimes you don't want to go with what the audience necessarily wants because that might not be the right move for the music so there's this little interplay and you kind of have to feel what's right and wrong at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like Derek Bailey, in reading that book, I got the sense that on one hand, he was keenly aware of everything around him. And on the other hand, he had his own internal score that he was kind of creating. And that was, and that was the tension that created all the incredible, you know, when you, if you ever hear him play, I mean, you, you weren't sure if he was listening to the other person because he was doing his own things. Then you realize he was listening to everything they were doing, but he wasn't trying to imitate the other person. He was trying to create a, a richness from being uh, unique inside that context. Good answers. Well, I think we should probably uh, let our musicians go and get ready for the concert, but please join me in thanking them, and well, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely to be here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.